Hello everyone, welcome to another Thursday night live stream. This is going to be the last one for until Thanksgiving, because I'll be out of town in China. Today we are talking about man-made fish. Should we love them? Should we hate them? Are there differences? Is DNA modified different than physically injected with dye? Is that different than breeding for genetics? Is that different than cutting the tail of a blood parrot to make it into a heart shape? Like, there's a lot of ways that fish are modified, and I personally land in some ways I'm okay with, some I'm indifferent to, some I'm actively against, and some I probably don't know exist yet or don't have an opinion on yet. So we're going to travel down a bunch of those, and I've got some notes to kind of keep me on track. Hopefully I ask that you guys don't uh, turn into a bloodbath in the chat, fighting each other to the death on whether a blood parrot is a cichlid or not. I kind of wish that uh, blood parrots and flower horns would develop into a meme, kind of like those two girls pointing at the cat and the cat ringing up the counterpoint. I wish that happened with some kind of fish thing because that would bring a lot of attention to the hobby. But if you're new here, all we talk about is freshwater fish. As you see, I have a giant fish tank behind me. And uh, consider subscribing for more content like this. So here we go. We're going to focus on fancy goldfish first because that is what is in the thumbnail and behind me. So as you'll see behind me here, I have a bunch of goldfish, but there are select types of goldfish. For the most part, I want goldfish that are highly functioning. And what I mean by that is they can find food, they can compete with other fish, they aren't so special needs that uh, they only have to live alone. So for me, that is arandas, and I prefer arandas that don't have giant, giant wens. So I have a few that are extra big that will have to be trimmed, and that will require extra maintenance on that fish, which for most fish, you don't have to do maintenance. So I would say that's special care. Uh, and then I have like ranchus in there, and I have some tosikins, and basically fan-tailed goldfish that aren't highly, highly modified. And what I mean by that is something like the thumbnail, a bubble eye goldfish, or another type would be a celestial eye, a pearl scale. Um, trying to think of other ones that, like a Siamese doll, there's arguments to whether that even exists, or is it just been dwarfed by underfeeding and keeping in a cramped aquarium. Those type, I'm not 100% against, it's just I prefer to keep these because they're easier to keep alive and they're higher functioning, meaning they can go find the food. We don't have to worry about, um, are their eyes working? Can they use them? Are they slowing them down? That type of thing. And so this modification, for the most part, I'm a fan of. I think they look good. I enjoy them. Now, that being said, if these never existed, would I enjoy the standard Comet Goldfish? I would. They're, I've kept them as well. I enjoy those. And I have kept some of these very um, care-intensive goldfish, like, well, most everything between working at pet stores and owning my own fish store at this point. We've kind of done it all, and people ask for certain things, we'll bring it in. And in general, bubble eyes, celestial eye, pearl scale, they're all, and, and even really black moors are dragon eye species, they're all, anything that starts kind of messing with the eyes, and in the case of the pearl scale, like kind of much smaller compact body, they just become harder to take care of. And with the eye species, sometimes they can't even see their food. Sometimes they develop cataracts. Sometimes, like in the bubble goldfish, the, the sacs filled with fluid, they're so like... I guess the way a fish swims is like this. And once you move these kind of beach balls attached to your face, it makes it much harder to feed, especially when having to compete against fish that don't have that impediment, right? And so that's where we recommend not mixing those kinds of goldfish with these types of goldfish, especially not comets with them. When they're all their type, it works out better, but you really have to avoid any sharp decorations uh, intakes on filters, they get sucked into it. And that's never fun when you have kind of a deflated one, you want to cut it off. And one of two things will happen. It'll either heal and it'll be missing one, which I think is actually kind of better for that fish. It leads to a better life long term. Or B, it will regrow. We've seen that as well. And 
So it's not that I would judge and say people can't keep that, but I would say that when you keep that that version of it, you know, don't keep lots of pointy sticks and then big intakes from your cancer filter that can suck their eyeball sacs out, basically. And it's just, they're high, it's high stakes, I guess. They're, and for me personally, I don't see the visual attraction appeal of that, where I'd be like, wow, this looks so cool, I'm willing to do all this extra work. But I get that some people would feel that way, and I get it. I have kept some of the dragon eye species, and that would be, you know, dragon goldfish or black moors or telescope eye. All that's in the same family. And they don't always have eye problems. They're just a higher susceptibility to getting those cataracts and stuff. And they, they're like in between high, high needs and low needs. They're, you know, they can kind of go with either one. But, you know, in general, I do find long term that they struggle to get good nutrition and that kind of stuff when kept with other goldfish. So I, I typically, that's why, you know, there's not really the moors in there. Like I could put some in, but right now I'm kind of focusing on more fish that will be more mobile. And when it comes to like the celestial eye where their eyes are upturned, their life is just a lot harder because you notice most fish can kind of, they're on their side of their head and they can kind of angle them and look. These ones kind of only look up. And so they have a really hard time seeing food or seeing obstacles that might be in their way of getting to food. They can sense the food through other sensory organs, but they can't see it. And that, that's the same as having a blind fish. And a blind fish can live just fine. It's just at a disadvantage. And when we put a blind fish versus a non-blind fish, we make them race to food, that can be a problem. Whereas if we were only keeping celestial pearl, or not celestial pearl, but celestial-eyed uh, goldfish, they're all on the same level playing field. I actually think that that fish might be better suited to some of the large bowls or indoor ponds where they're mostly looking up and then selectively feeding them floating food, which is a controversial topic with goldfish owners in general. But I believe that to be an easier way to take care of them if I was going to take care of them. So even in just goldfish, there's a swath of do I like, don't I like. And I am of the opinion that for the most part, if someone else else out there likes it, they should have every right to keep it. Um, I, at the, per, at the store, personally, we kind of evaluate a skill level, and if we think it's a terrible idea, like, let's say, a bubble-eyed goldfish going into a goldfish bowl, which is a train wreck of an idea, we magically can't find any to order, is typically what happens. Um, and we keep guiding them towards, like, but this species is in stock, and would make a much better fit for this 10-gallon aquarium and stuff like that. So that's where I feel or where I land specifically on goldfish themselves, which, you know, it's funny how some species are held in high regard because they've been around a very long time and maybe they're related to kings and emperors and, and there's status symbols around them, let's say. And then there's some species that don't have that without that extra, like, connection. They get a much harder wrap, I think. And so those would be like a blood parrot. There's, while, like, in my opinion, a blood parrot and a goldfish, they're very, very, very similar fish. When it comes to temperament, keeping them, the special needs part of it, even sizing, you know, besides, like, physical or differences like in temperature but the reality is i could have a ton of blood parrots back there and whether you see orange goldfish or you see orange blood parrots or some different types of color to blood parrots really they're going to interact with each other fairly similar you might say oh blood parrots are a little more aggressive like if you watch goldfish breed they're very aggressive while breeding and even right now some of the goldfish have their breeding stars on their gill plates and so breeding is going on all the time so you know, they're very, actually very similar in terms of, I think, as a hobbyist, keeping it as a pet. And so that might be like, you know, keeping two different mid-sized dogs. Like, really, yeah, there's different traits and that kind of stuff, but they're pretty similar. So I personally, I like, I don't keep blood parrots in my store all the time or anything like that, but I don't actively discourage them either. I think the biggest problem is that people buy them when they're very small. And then they, they do get large. And that I have the same problem with goldfish as well. 
However, goldfish are much, much more popular than blood parrots. And so where you might see goldfish in our store and rarely see blood parrots, it's because more money is being made on goldfish and people come and ask for them every day, whereas a blood parrot maybe once or twice a month, someone's actively asking for it. And so that is one of the big determinations on whether we would sell it. Now, whether you'd keep it, I'd say keep what you like. And you've seen me do blood parrots before. I like those as well. And, you know, I think just because I, you know, don't eat pizza every day doesn't mean I don't like it, right? I like Mexican food, but I can have go and have pizza. Same thing. Just because I don't keep blood parrots every day doesn't mean I don't like them and I wouldn't keep them. But uh, maybe it's not my favorite food, right? All right, and then we get to, I think, the next level, or not next level, um, things that I would say maybe are more acceptable, and that would be the hybrids that kind of can happen in nature slash happened a really long time ago and improved upon the fish like everyone agrees. And when I say everyone, this is like, Take 100 people off the street that don't really know fish. They'd just be like, yes, this fish is better. And that would be things like guppies, uh, mollies, platies, all the endlers. Like, we've now mixed them to make them better. The reality is a platy from the wild is relatively muted color. Same thing with swordtails. Almost no color in a swordtail. When you cross a swordtail and a platy, you can bring the color into the swordtail then you can line breed that, and you can end up with a red sword tail. And then we can work on fin genetics and get it to have a really high fin. Then we can work on getting it longer sword, or maybe we want the sword to be black instead of red. And each time we work on this, we are changing kind of the strain. Now, we all assume that we're making fish weaker when we do this, and that is 100% true if we aren't outcrossing, and what that means is you take this ball of genetics that you have that has all the traits you want, and you cross it with something over here that has different genetics, but is not so far away that it will look completely different. And then you keep doing that to strengthen the gene so that it could be even a more robust fish than the original fish. That can actually become a thing. A hybrid can actually be stronger genetically than the original. Now, if we don't do any outcrossing and we're not taking away defects and that type of stuff, we can end up with a fish that is weaker than the original. Now, we run into that all the time with goldfish and that kind of stuff, and we still love them. But we do have the ability to strengthen them back up, and I think that is where we kind of accept platies, mollies, uh, plat or swordtails, guppies, and that kind of stuff, because... They are so hardy now that we've been working on them for 30 years, 40 years, right? And the newer stuff that I think isn't as hardy is where we kind of cast more judgment. And I'll get to that. There's like, like a group of fish later or some fish that fall into these groups, I think, where I think in 20 or 30 years, we will think of them like guppies where it's like, oh, yeah, we've been doing it so long. And you know what? They are pretty good now that we will have a different opinion. So, but when it comes to live bears, there are so many wild ones that we honestly never needed to hybridize them. And yet by hybridizing, we get some very, very cool looking fish and most of us enjoy them. There's always purists out there that would say, I would never keep anything that is man-made. But for the most part, the average public, the average hobbyist, they walk in and they go, that red sword tail looks amazing. That could never exist in the wild or doesn't exist in the wild, right? When you show them wild type sword tails, most people go, uh, yeah, it's all right. You know, and that's when you're showing them Alvarezi and, and some of like the, you know, like my eye, great big body, not a lot of color. Same with Montezuma sword tails. Like there's a lot of cool sword tails that don't have a lot of color, but you make them that giant body with all that color and then you've got a winning package. And part of it is we have an industry built around this. And that is, you know, wholesalers got to make money, farms got to make money, stores got to make money. If they didn't exist, if we could outlaw all of them forever, then people would be forced to maybe buy a sword tail with no color. Or maybe it would be like other fish that just never get kept, like goodyids for the most part, 
are a live bear just like them, not nearly as much color, and yet almost never are gonna be like pulled off the shelf, you know, and go, oh, I would like to own that fish. You kinda have to be advanced in the hobby, wanna have a Karis fish, and go based on that. Not so much this thing is super pretty. There are some that look pretty okay, but even then, it's the man-made ones, like the Trout Goodyear and the, um, what is it, Red Lagos, what I, can I think of the scientific name? Um, Crocodon Lateralis, the Red Logos Crocodon Lateralis. Those are sought after because they're man-made and so red. Same with the Black Prince or the Black Beauty. And so even then, it's, oh, the man-made ones are the ones that we wanted because they actually look better. And believe it or not, this is a vanity hobby. We want it to look good. And you might not care about the color of a fish, but you might want your fish to look healthy. You might want to look at their behavior. You want that good, whether it might be a crazy weird behavior to look good, right? So we are in that vanity thing, and this is just what that hobby is. And so we can't always just rule out like, well, that wouldn't have existed in nature. We, I think we need to judge on, does it look cool? And a lot of times... We don't get to be the judge. The average public is. And that's the thing to remember here is that if we create some fish that is absolutely crazy and no one buys it, it will just go away. It's when things stay around, clearly people are buying it. That's why people are making more of it. And that's the thing to remember is this is something that might have been an accident. Then everyone wants it. Now it's bred. And that's kind of how like balloon fish came about is it was a happy accident of culling, 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 got out into the wild, so to speak. And I say wild, I mean out into the public. And then people wanted more of it. And then it became like, well, we could just breed these this way. And then we started getting into nano species, right? Like we liked smaller aquariums. Well, a balloon-sized animal is typically smaller. And we might be getting some defects with that or some changes in behavior or... Like if we look at a balloon molly... A balloon molly that is this big is really cool, looks like it has a giant mohawk on that male, and yet is crazy derpy compared to a four inch molly that like is an Olympic bodybuilder in comparison, right? Like you've got this Olympic bodybuilder of a of a molly that's four inches and just like ripped and this big around and can lift four pounds out of the water. And then you've got this balloon molly that's like an oompa loompa that's just cute and cuddly very different fish, both sail fins, and yet we've taken it really far. That being said, for the most part, balloon mollies are enjoyable. They're not quite as hardy, but they haven't been around nearly as long. I think give it 10 or 15 years where they keep outcrossing to wild strains of mollies and keep increasing the genetics, and we can get a really stable small molly that will also have all the color and characteristics we want. So... With the balloon fish, I think that is the problem is that for the most part, like 10 years ago, we maybe had balloon rams, right? But we didn't have all this crazy stuff like balloon rainbow fish. We didn't have balloon garamis. We didn't have balloon sword tails even. You know, in my hobby, the way I remember it, it was kind of like balloon um, rams. And then the next thing I, th I ever remember seeing was balloon mollies, right? And now we've got platies, now we've got garamis, we've got rainbow fish, we've got koi, we've got, you know, well, maybe not koi, they're a short body version, same with arowanas and that kind of stuff. And it's led based on, you know, part of me wonders when we get into this debate, if you will, what is better for a home hobbyist or the hobby in general? An arowana, a silver arowana that should get four feet and will likely die at the, well, we just know odds are it'll die between 18 inches and two feet by hopping out of an aquarium from not having enough space. Like nine out of 10 arowanas are going to die that way. So if we know that, is that worse or is a short-bodied arowana where we've inten intentionally bred it to keep it more compact, but maybe now it doesn't jump out of the aquarium, but maybe it has some different genetic problems of maybe the organs are a little cramped, or maybe it has a curved spine, or 
maybe there's something else we don't know. Like part of it is it doesn't have to be directly related. Like maybe the gene in which we can create short body also leads to cataracts later in life or something like we don't always know what pairs. And so, but I do ask the question like, which one's better or worse? Like if it jumps out and dies, that's bad. If we modify it and it ends up with another bad trait, that's also bad. But what if it lives longer? Like if it lives 10 years and is blind, is that better than three years and died? Maybe to some people, but I would argue that we could change both ways. We could make silver arowana is harder to get a hold of, or we could make bigger tanks cheaper to get a hold of, or we could improve education. On the other side, maybe the first round is short body arowanas with cataract problems, but maybe we outcross that to uh, another set of genes from a different silver arowana farm, and it doesn't bring over that cataract problem. And then now we do have a short body that is more sustainable over the course of 5, 10, 15, 20 years, right? So it's hard to, for me to say good or bad because you don't, I can't judge it until we get there, right? If we do nothing, we're still just going to kill 9 out of 10 arowanas because they just don't reach appropriate tanks. If we do nothing on the other side, kind of the same fate. So mostly it's trying to do the right thing of like, well, someone's going to buy a 4-foot arowana even though it's only this big right now. Make sure we educate them, educate them, educate them. Try and talk them out of it. Make sure they still do it. They're still going to do it. Same thing on the other side. If if short body arowanas were cheap, I might try one, honestly. But I, I've never seen one for sale stateside. Doesn't mean they'll never be here. It's not here yet. I don't know how rare they are or how recessive of a gene it is. Um, but not all genes are compatible. We learned that with, like guppies and mollies, you breed them together, they become sterile. We learned that with blood parrots for a long time, the rate at which male blood parrots were sterile, sterile was very, very high. Not so much more, so much anymore because we've been able to outcross and fix that defect. It still happens, but not nearly in the high percentage that it was. So we can fix things over time. Guppies and mollies have never been fixed so far, but you know, and there's genes that are lethal, right? And what that means is you, if you combine these genes, the fry are non-viable and they just die. And we also know that there's genes where, like on a black sword tail, if we make the entire sword tail all the way black, we have that capability. We can make black body, black tail, everything. But the genes that go together to make that happen also cause cancer. And so you get a lot of growths and tumors and all that kind of stuff. But if you leave either A, the body not black, or the tail not black, those genes never go together, and therefore you get a fish that won't have cancerous growths and problems. So that doesn't mean we won't ever find one. Like, for instance, we know currently that there are two different strains of high fin. Now, here's something crazy to think about. Originally, all high fins we ever saw for sword tails came from uh, one version of it. And what was it like? I can't remember her name. It was a woman. It was a scientist woman. I want to say it started with like a J. Uh, had developed this. And everyone for like the last 40 years had been developed from that. That's how inbred it was. But then there was another strain that came about, which was really nice because the way in which they expressed traits were different. And then like Greg Sage at Select Aquatics, he actually had a group of my eye uh, sword tails that naturally developed a hyphen. It was just a little bit. And then he kept breeding that for years and that actually became a third uh, instance of it where that took you know seven or eight years of his life to develop that out, but it allowed some genetic variation so that we could potentially fix stuff if people cared enough to do it. And that's what I think we should focus on. If we're going to focus on a man-made fish, let's always focus on improving it instead of just like, well, we got our money, we can get out. Like, let's keep going and making it better. Like a product, you know, if we release a product and we find a way to make it better, we will make it better. All right. So then we go to like long fin species. I actually think long fin for a lot of species makes them better. And what do I mean by that? Things like zebra danios, and like barbs, both rosy barbs, tiger barbs, that kind of stuff, adding the extra finage slows them down and they become a better pet, I think. Now, 
in a pet scenario where we're going to keep them in a 20 gallon, a 30 gallon, a 40 gallon aquarium, slowing them down is like making, you know, their home bigger. Whereas the faster versions that can dart back and forth seems very cramped. In the wild, they don't have that problem. They have like, oh, I have unlimited space. So I can see how long fins there wouldn't be advantageous. So I'm not against it, but there are some long fin uh, variants that have gone so far that it is like on angelfish. They've gotten so long, and guppies as well. We can get fins so long that fish can no longer get off the ground. And that is a point we've gone too far. And again, I think working with genes, so that's why sometimes you'll hear there's normal fin angels, there's uh, veil tail or long fin angels, and then you have like mid fin angels. And that's where they're trying to bridge the gap of like, we don't need it to be 12 miles long. We also just don't want it to be standard. And that's that kind of happy medium. And I think that's a good place to shoot for. And, you know, not every animal is necessarily better off for long fin. Like uh, neon tetras, they come in a long fin form, but they are much weaker, right? But at the same time, we probably haven't worked with the genetics enough to make that a strong fish. It's, just, it's still it's really rare, hard to get a hold of, hard to breed. And then there's sometimes things like the long fin gold white cloud. The gold plus the long fin, you can't just keep making those. You have to breed gold, like a non-long fin gold, to a uh, normal colored long fin. When you do that, some will come out gold and long fin. However, I've never been able to breed them, and I've never known anyone else to be able to breed gold long fins and get them to reproduce. Some, one, either male or female is sterile there. And so until we can change genetics and stuff, that's just always going to be the answer until someone figures it out. So, you know, I'm not sure that that fish necessarily needs that, but it looks really good, and I love it. So I, I do think there are some benefits to it, though. And I wouldn't judge someone for going, I love the long fin Oscar versus the normal. Great. I think they're kind of cool, too. In saltwater, I think long fin and clownfish are kind of cool. They look cool to me. So, and if I'm the one that's going to buy it and keep it and take care of it for the next 10 years, then I'm the one that makes the choice. I think that's how it goes. So then we come to like glowfish. I'm actually, for the most part, 100% okay with glowfish. Now glowfish are, they've had DNA modified. When you breed them, they will breed true. And I really like when we visited some farms over seas that they would breed some and they were very healthy. They were doing it naturally. And what I mean by that is like they were cleaning the ponds with plants and doing all this kind of stuff. And they were actually seeing sunlight and all that kind of cool stuff, right? But there is the part of that which I don't like personally. And that is that it's not legal for, let's say, me to breed a... Um, green zebra danio, and then sell it because there's patents on it in the United States. And so that part is that's like more of a corporate thing I don't agree with. But in terms of do I think glowfish are good for the hobby? I think they could be very good. And why I say that is new people are attracted to glowfish. There's lots of color. Color to dollar ratio is pretty good. And... I think that is worth something right there of like, ooh, people are attracted to this. That's very important. The problem I find is I don't find glowfish to be genetically very hardy. And when I went and visited an unnamed farm, they say they work on that a lot and that that is a problem. And so things like glow sharks and all this stuff that's coming out and they're working on it and they know it's going to take a long time, but it costs a lot of money to make the initial stock. So you almost have to like make the initial stock, sell a ton, make a ton of money, and then reinvest it. The problem, or what I don't know is, how expensive is it to make the initial stock? Like, will they just forever just go, well, if they just stay weak, you know, in some corporate structures, like if it dies at eight months old and people replace it, why would we make it live longer? You know, that happens in dry goods all the time. People go, well, if they buy a new one every six months because it breaks, you make more money. 
well, it's bad for the environment, it's bad for my customer, it's bad for business. And I would say the same thing about a glowfish. So I, I really hope that they are actually continuing to try and improve longevity and things like that in the fish. Um, and they say they are, but I don't know. Because I don't, I don't test like every year, like well, how, how hardy is the zebra danios now? And as we bring out new uh, strains of glowfish, I don't know how many they're starting with. Like what if they start with an initial stock of 100 glow sharks of a color? where maybe the first Danio started with 12. I, I don't know that answer. So I just hope that as Glowfish brand grows, that they're gonna get more hardy because if, they, if we ever needed a hardy fish, it's ones that's attracting beginners. And that's the problem I have is I don't carry them because of that reason is that most people walk in and be like, I want all of this color in this tank and then trying to tell them that they're actually very hard to take care of. If they Google it, you're going to go to Zebra Danio. Zebra Danios on the internet say they're very, very hardy. This is a modified Zebra Danio. And you end up going in this crazy conversation that probably either loses them as a customer or B, they just end up buying it anyway. So, but Glowfish in general, I think they look cool. It's been real hard not to buy. Like this, the, the red tiger barbs are really cool looking. Um, I'm not a big fan of the green color. Pink is meh. You know, very few of them are, am I like, wow, I really want to keep that. But the red tiger barbs are very cool. And they come into our store through donations and that kind of stuff. And we sell them at the dollar bin just to rehome them. Because, you know, even if you're a modified fish and maybe you're not the healthiest strain ever, you deserve to live a good life somewhere. And we help facilitate that. Then there's, what is the last? Well, I guess the last thing would be things in which we physically modify fish. And that would be tattooing fish. I'm not okay with that. Um, and it's one, like even if we were to sedate the fish correctly and then tattoo them, I'm not sure that it's needed because we can breed a lot of color. Like I don't know that we need a blood parrot with a heart on it just for Valentine's Day, right? Uh, and the thing is, I know we're not sedating them correctly. We're not making sure they don't get infected. We're not sterilizing between the use of the tattoo gun on the fish. Like there's all these things we're not doing. So it's really easy to go, oh, I'm against that. If they cleaned up all of that, then it'd be like, well, you know, who am I to say, you know, if they were doing everything right, it's hard to say. Um, but when it comes to injecting fish, I'm kind of against, well, not kind of, I'm against in injecting fish with dye because typically it'll shorten their life and two, it fades. So six months in to that white skirt tetra that was pink, six months in, it's just a white skirt tetra. So it's kind of bamboozling the customer, which I'm not a fan of at all. Then you've got things like blueberry shrimp where they're kept in very high dye levels in the water and that as they keep molting goes away and then you end up with this like clear shrimp. I'm not a fan of that either. Uh, when it comes to making heart-shaped fish, so things like kissing gouramis and blood parrots, when they're young, they just clip out basically the tail and that will make a heart shape. So you've got this bulbous front end and then it comes to a point at the back. You can do that with most fish, really, but they typically only do it with kissing fish and blood parrots. And blood parrots, because of their color, kind of looks like a heart. And with the kissing fish, kissing is already, um, you know, part of the Valentine's Day thing. It works on, it's on brand, if you will, or on event, where you're like, oh, it's a kissing fish. I'll buy a kissing fish that kind of looks like a heart for someone at home, right? And... You know, again, we're modifying it and it's strictly only making matters worse. Like if we just cut arms off of kids because we like to buy or, you know, have one-armed kids, like that's clearly just worse than a two-armed kid. Same thing, like a fish with a tail is clearly just superior to one without given the choice. Um, so that's why I'm against that. And also, you know, a lot of times that practice, while trying to keep bacterial infections and stuff down, it's always a cost benefit analysis of like, well, we use too many meds, cost too much money. If we lose some fish, that's fine. And I, I think most people, given that choice, if they knew all that information, would choose not to get the Valentine's Day version of a fish. But 
that information is not provided a lot of times, and so they don't know any better. And so that's why I might shy away from it, and I would never sell it at my store. That being said, the only time I would sell something like that is if it came in as a donation. Because once it's already in my store as a living creature, who am I to, like, kill it, right? So it's like, well, it needs to go to a home, but I wouldn't intentionally be, like, making sure the people are getting money from clipping the the fins and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's I don't know, a touchy subject, I would say, because I'm sure there's people out there that love that fish. Um, and you could probably do it, you know... I, and I, I, I realize that there's a case you made is how is that any different than, for instance, having to trim the wen on a Randa goldfish so it can still remain to sea or, or a, um, a uh, ranchu. I agree with that. You know, except for in a perfect world, I would buy one, and you can buy them that, in theory, you buy them and they're not supposed to have big wen growth, in which case you wouldn't have that problem. But then if it does grow into that problem, I think fixing it then, you went in with better intentions where, you know, it's not like you buy a a blood parrot and then its just, tail just falls off. And you're like, who was I to know it wasn't going to have a tail? Like, you know before you buy it. Um, where the goldfish, you don't always know. And not, you know, it's like half of them. It's like half, 50-50 now that the winds just get way out of control. And I bet you something comes down to feeding, you know, like most of the win on a goldfish is fat deposits. So I wonder if in our eternal quest to get better foods for all of our fish where we value like krill, we value salmon, we value all these high fatty foods. And if that is leading to exponentially fast when growth, where if we focus on a diet of just like veggies and spirulina and that kind of stuff, if it would really slow down the wind growth. That'd be a good experiment for someone to run in a classroom or something like that and get two goldfish or maybe four goldfish. One tank gets, you know, like a krill-based food. The other one gets a vegetable-based food. Is there any difference in wen growth long-term? Five years in, what does it look like? I'd be interested to know because that would, that would serve the whole community of like, oh, we could totally not have to worry. Just like with pufferfish, right? We know that we have to feed them shelled food so their teeth don't overgrow. If we knew we had to feed way more veggie and low protein diet so that when growth didn't get out of control we would just do that as hobbyists i think if the information was there and documented what do i think about man-made fish when it comes to african cichlids and flower horns flower horns i have no problem because everyone pretty much knows that's a man-made fish it's never passed off as this crazy looking flower horn is that an oscar is that a trimac? Like, it, it's so far removed, there's no mistaking it. Whereas in a lot of the man-made African cichlids, you get these hybrids going on that we don't know. You don't know that that yellow lab is mixed with a zebra at some point, and that's why it's more orangey than it should be, right? And so that I'm a little more against, just because if someone wanted, let's say you're looking online, you look up a yellow lab acromis, and it looks really nice yellow, it's really good looking, nice black fins and all that. And you go to the store and that's what you buy and you raise it up and then you look at it and you're going, mine's more of a peach color, not as much of a yellow color. That I think is a bad experience. And so that's why I might be against it. Whereas if it was really well documented and saying these are peach colored labs, then I don't really have a problem with it because someone knows what they're getting. They chose to buy that. And what's happened a little bit in the African cichlid hobby is because we never really got after that, now it's really hard to find like a true yellow lab. So there's money to be made there when you do breed true ones, but the damage has kind of already been done. There's so many circulated out there. And I think what happened was, is my own personal being an African cichlid guy for a long time, I feel like it really accelerated when Petco's and PetSmart's or chain stores of the like started selling assorted African cichlids. Now, I don't blame them, right? So we're thinking we would blame them, but well, we don't blame them. I think what happened is it became a dumping ground. Like when I, the store that I managed, we were a hardcore African cichlid store. We wanted pure lines. We wanted all that, right? Well, if we would turn down hybridized fish all the time, 
Maybe a wholesaler wouldn't. Maybe the wholesaler knows, oh, the chain stores will take that. They don't know any better. And so then you have all these fish entering through mass markets that kind of look like a yellow lab. They kind of look like this. Then a hobbyist might level up in their hobby and they become a better hobbyist. Now they're breeding it. And now they're breeding yellow labs and they're selling it to a store. And that store might not be able to know that like, wait a second, that's not pure anymore. And then now they're selling it as a yellow lab, not an assorted African, a yellow lab. Someone's buying it. Now they're breeding it. Now they've got yellow labs, but maybe they've only been in the hobby for six years and they don't know that 16 years ago, yellow labs looked electric yellow, like they used to be called electric yellow. And now they're more of an orangey color, right? Same thing with Lulupi and a few other Africans that are very easy to tell that with. And so I don't think it's the fault of the Petco and PetSmart or chain store because they were ordering assorted Africans. I think it probably was entrepreneurial wholesalers and farmers that go, oops, oh, well, they'll take it. And part of it is, you know, the corporations do make contracts that are crazy. Like if they can't fulfill an order, they have to pay them, right? So at one point in my career, there was wholesalers calling my retail store going, do you have rosy barbs for sale? We'll buy them all. We have to fill the orders for PetSmart. Because each one they didn't fill, they got like fined in their contract $2. And so even though that's a fish that sells for much less wholesale, if they don't provide the fish to go in the planogram on that wall, they'll terminate contracts and all that. So they were literally calling pet stores, do you have any, we'll buy them all. Which we saw the result of the next like four or five months of, we couldn't buy any for our own stores because they were a shortage. Like whatever farm or whoever the main producer of that, maybe they had an illness run through or something go down, that they were in shortage, contracts just had to be filled and you know, it gets desperate. So. You know, that's what I, I think just from what I've heard and what I've witnessed and what I think logic, logically has happened. But I don't know that to be a fact. So don't, you know, quote it as like, you know, here in history it was written as this. I just, that's what I, I've seen go on. All right. I know we've got quite a few new members and super chats and I'm sure you guys have questions now or have been asking tons of questions and I've kind of gotten through, I think, a a fair portion of it. I'm sure there's other things to address here that you guys will bring up. I'm like, oh, of course we need to talk about that. Uh, but first, we'll address the new members. Cindy C, MJ, and Sail and Keep Fish. Oh, oh and Jessica uh, Butchelt. All new members closing in on that new emoji. I think we've got, that would make uh, 19 more to go. All right. So some super chats. Mascara Terra says the super chat is in honor of my balloon mollies who are man-made, but they got me into the hobby and I love them more than most people. Exactly. Like I, I value that getting people into the hobby and then like that factor is very important. And then maybe you still love them or maybe you hate them, like whatever you graduate to, but you might've been pulled in by a glowfish. You might've been pulled in by a balloon molly or me. I got pulled in just by like plants and, and tetras, right? And I've kept everything under the sun. And as you keep more things, you go, oh, why would I keep that when I can keep this? Why would I, you know, why would I make pizza at home when I can order pizza? I'm lazy. And some people go, huh, you order pizza? I only make my own pizza. Like, great, I, I like it. You only buy wild caught fish. Cool, you have the purest strain. I'm lazy. I only like pizza this much. Different stuff. All right. AC asks, he's got an electric blue Jack Dempsey Juvenile, which, man-made fish, by the way. Colors quick, uh, oh, changes color quickly depending on tank position. It will lighten 15 seconds later, it'll get darker. Is this normal? He's eating actively. Yes. Typically, fish can kind of turn color on and off based on stress, based on environment. Very common if you took a fish Maybe you buy a fish at the store, it looks one color, you take it home, you put it in your tank, it looks nothing like that. Stress could cause that. Could have been on black substrate at the store, maybe you have a light substrate. It's going to try and match. So if you have light colored stuff, it's going to try and lighten up. Or it's going to try and darken up. Very apparent in discus and a lot of fish. So I wouldn't say that you necessarily have a problem on your hands. Um, fish can just do that. 
I would I would make sure it's not stressed out or you know maybe try to figure out well, what is it doing but I wouldn't say that is necessarily out of the norm. We got a sticker from Caleb Aquatics. Thank you. How many goalies are in the tank behind me? I don't know. I added five more on Tuesday. I don't know the count. The count is much lower than what I'm going to run long term. I turn the water changes down to uh, five minutes. So we run five minutes of water twice a week and testing nitrates in this system are less than five still. Not that I'm like trying to like, I want to load it to the max, but I want more fish than are currently in there. And so I added five more. And I'm going to let that kind of just marinate and chill. And then maybe in six or eight weeks, I'm testing again and going, well, with this schedule, we still have tons of room or I need to bump up the water change a little bit. And I want a very active aquarium that I can sit and look at and just go, wow, it's super fun. Look at all these piggies. And, you know, I'm always on the hunt for a few more. Matthew Carpenter, for being awesome, learned so much through your channel, and thanks for the info. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I'm going to toot my own horn here, and I am kind of impressed sometimes at the amount of stuff I've learned through osmosis. And I think about this a lot by visiting big fish farms and the wild and, and just that kind of stuff. The stuff you can pick up just by talking to people that are like, oh, you've done... You know, like we were talking to someone that was breeding the glow fish and they were in charge of, you know, the glow sharks and they had a new secret project I wasn't allowed to look at and all that. But by talking with them and seeing the facility in person, I have more knowledge than I did two years ago of like, well, yeah, I've seen them at the pet store. I've kept them. And when you talk to the people that are actually taking care of them and you start seeing like, whoa, you literally have like 800 adult green glow sharks, you know, and you learn about the process and you're seeing all these things and the equipment they're using that gave me a new appreciation of what they're trying to do. And that person also works for the public aquarium and they're managing things there. And so the people themselves are very into fish and doing things sustainably and all that. And so it gave me new hope of like, okay, well, there's some good people working on some of this stuff. Not that they like that person only works with glow sharks, right? So someone else is working on tetras and someone else is working on tiger barbs and all that. But, you know, I got new insight. And so a lot of times I'm like, wow, I forgot that I had learned about that. Or, yeah, I do. I, you know, as years go on and I experience more and more and more, I f I'm starting to realize like, okay, this is kind of a crazy set of knowledge to be putting together that, you know, because I always just did it because I enjoyed it and I loved it and I wanted to learn more. And now I realize like, Wow, this is getting to be quite a, you know, like, oh, I'm visiting this country again. I'm visiting this again. I'm learning more. And so now that's why I've really taken an active part into trying to do more species profiles, do more top tens, do more live streams, like do more uh, teaching and less, this is my fish room type stuff. Not that I'm not sprinkling that in, but I want to make sure that I'm passing along uh a proportional amount of knowledge that I can. And it is only hearsay knowledge. Like I don't, I'm not going to write papers on it and that kind of stuff, but it is, here's what I've seen. You know, if I hang out with Dean, we filmed for uh, 13 hours on Tuesday and I pick up a nugget of information that he's learned over 40 years of breeding this fish. And I pass that along. Someone might find that useful. Now, neither of us are writing a paper about it, but if I never talk about it, no one's ever going to find out. So I really do enjoy learning. And so I'm glad that some of you guys are sticking around for years. Like at the beginning, I never thought of it that way. Like I never thought four years down the road, people will still be watching and learning about fish tanks with me. Uh, but I also never thought, oh, I'll go keep learning about fish tanks. I always think like somewhere there's the end of the road, but there's always more I want to go do. Like I want to go visit marijuana farms. I want to go do this stuff. So even I'm still having fun, which is good. Ooh, I got a, I got a, a fox. Is that a fox or a cat from Matt Heskins? Could go either way. Do I like long fin, long fin Oscars? I do like long fin Oscars. Uh, Randy hates them, whereas Randy loves flower horns. I'm not a huge fan of flower horns, so it's it's completely weird. I think it's not even a man-made issue. It's just like visually saw it. 
or taste of this food. Do I like it? Don't I like it? It's just that reaction for me. It's not, I'm morally opposed to that. No, it's just, yeah, I like that. Mm, nah, I don't really like that. But that doesn't mean it won't change. Maybe I change my opinion when like, so like if you only ever see baby butterfly koi, you're like, ah, those things are dumb. But when you see them at three feet, you're like, whoa, their nostril, what are those things called? I can't remember. The nostril things. I'm going to Google it. That's a word I don't say very often. Uh, what are... Is it nostril flare? Let me see. Is it nostril flares? I feel like that's the right thing, but Google's not telling me. Looking for it. Yes, the nose. Oh, this thing's not in-depth enough to talk about nostril flares. I think it is nostril flares. Someone will chime in, and I'll read the comment in a few days and be like, yes, it was nostril flares, or oh, it's that. Oh, yeah. But anyway, like those get crazy long, and then like their barbels get crazy long, and they look really cool, and they definitely do look like a dragon, whereas like that little butterfly koi does not. And so, yes, opinion can always change. At the beginning, I was like, nah, I don't like, I don't like butterfly or longfin koi. And you start seeing some really cool big ones, and you're like, yes, I have to have these. And I think most people can go through that. Like, even if I'm like, eh, I don't know about flower horns right now, you go to the flower horn competition, you're like, oh, I'm about that one, though, apparently. So, and I, again, like food. You try one food once, ah, I don't like it, but what if you try the master of that food and you're like, wow, it's the best thing I ever had. Like, perfect example in my life, calamari. Half the time, best thing I've ever eaten. Half the time, it's like chewing on gum. If it's done right, really good. Done wrong, sucks. And I think we can, you know, see that in fish too, of like, oh, that setup was awesome, I want that. Or, eh, I don't. Have I ever heard of Frank Spetta's? Yes. Think I'll ever catch fish in Southeast Asia? Yes. Yes to both those, Samuel. No more auto feeder? Yes, we have discontinued our auto feeder for the time being. Uh, we have crossed the threshold of 5% defect. And so that means I think we were at between 7 and 8% defective. And what would happen is typically they'd open them up, they'd set them up, and they just wouldn't work or they would stop working within the day. A lot of times it was that second hand. We now need to open a bunch, find the ones that don't work, and so maybe we gotta take, you know, 100 of them or whatever, take videos, and then present the videos to the manufacturer. The manufacturer said they were willing to uh, credit us for any ones that didn't work. That doesn't work though, because we have to ship it, another one to you guys, you guys are frustrated, all that, so what we want is, we only want to continue doing it if we can take out the bug with that. That being said, the ones that everyone has, or like all the ones running in my fish room, if they don't have that one bug, they work great. Like, like clockwork, we've got so many uh, running at the, at the warehouse, and you know, even like on Tuesday, Dean was like, I'll take some. You know, like they're, as long, what do, what do I wanna say? It's like, it's either A, you get a dud off the bat, or you get something that's gonna run until the end of time. And so I, I just run our company, and that's why we stopped selling snails and other things. Like if we cross a 5% threshold, that's time to put on the brakes and reevaluate and go, can we work with someone else? Can they fix it? And it might take a year, it might take a month. Like we might be able to see them when I'm in China next week and go, hey, how do we get to the bottom of this? And you know that didn't present itself in our testing though. And so unfortunately, that's where we have egg on our face going, we could have just said nothing, and it's really easy just to go, well, it's only 7%, like that's honestly better than some products we've discontinued in the past from other manufacturers, but it's not that profitable for us as an item already, and we wanna fix it. The whole goal is let's make a better feeder, not like, well, if you get a good one, it's good, but if you get a bad one, you gotta reship it. And so, and it was a customer service nightmare for Candy, trying to troubleshoot, getting a new one shipped out, and it's hard for me to re or not reship, but continue selling a product I know breaks a threshold. And uh, yeah, As, what am I? What am I trying to say here? I'm really hoping that 
oh, we'll upgrade this little gear, or oh, this little thing right here is the culprit. But first, we, you know, we don't speak Chinese, so it is hard to uh, convey a problem specifically so that their R&D team could start figuring it out. Whereas, and, and it could be a print run thing, like maybe only this run had the problem. And so we don't know, like they can't just make 10 more and go, well, these all work. So, you know, we need to take some of our defective ones and, and figure out what is the problem with that specific run. Is that something that always happens or was it, oh, this happened during this production run. And so we've removed them. We have hundreds of units in the warehouse still. So if you have a defective one or anything like that, like we'll give you your money back or send you another one. And I'm, I'm installing more this weekend in my fish room even. Um, but until we are confident that we can sell a product that will stay under that 5% threshold, you know, so that means five out of a hundred would less than that would have to have a problem. And, you know, honestly, there's products out there that, you know, were much higher than like when we originally dropped the Phoenix lighting systems that were planet plus and that kind of stuff, they were up at 11%. And even though we stayed with them for quite a while, because they said, oh, we fixed it. Oh, we fixed it. We fixed it. And time and time again, it wasn't getting fixed. And so that's why we dropped it long term. Whereas like the Phoenix Stingray Light, like I want to say their defective rate's like one in a thousand. Like almost never does a Stingray Light go bad. Like that is like a modern marvel of construction. I love that light or that electronic for that matter. All right. Do I prefer wild mollies like Greg Sage's? Um, I mean, I, I've had his sale fin mollies before. So preferring them, I don't know. I like them all. I love those big ones he's got. I also love dragon blood mollies. I also love balloon mollies. So preferring, if you were to give me a choice, I would say I'd prefer to have all three in my fish room. That being said, if I'm forced to make a choice, it's whichever one I haven't had lately. Like, oh, okay, I'm going to go with these ones because I did those ones a year ago. Or I think, you know, I might want to breed them and sell them at the store. So, for instance, a dragon blood molly is going to do much better in the store if that was my end goal. But, no, I love his fish, but I also love a lot of other fish. Two new members with Fierce Wolf and Joseph Fredway. Well, Fierce Wolf is re-upping because he's got that um, porcupine puffer, so... Thanks for re-upping. I'm going to check in and see how close are we to the threshold. 21 away? Are we losing people? I think we're like losing people during the stream. Either that or my original math was bad. One of those two. 21? Yeah, 21. All right. So now we can jump into the crazy chat. I'm going to scroll way up and grab some stuff. So that everyone's got a fair chance. I'm in the UK. What's your best meds packages for us here in the UK? Many thanks. No idea. You guys have so many awesome meds that we don't have. Like I'm super jealous of your skinny clownless disease med. Other like because I haven't used them, I can't recommend them. But I can say that um, salt. Salt is universal. I wish. I wish I knew. By the way, I haven't scheduled a meetup in the UK. Half of me doesn't want to do it. It's not that I don't want to meet you guys. It's that I am going to be crazy burnt out from traveling. So I'm really trying to dial in like, all right, I got to reach out to one of these companies and just see what I can do. If I can do it on a Saturday because I leave Sunday, blah, blah, blah. So let's stay tuned, basically. Stay tuned. If I announce it, show up. It'll be fun. If I don't, my apologies. Half of me wants to wait to see, like, like clockwork, I usually come back sick from foreign countries. And if I come back sick and go to another foreign country back to back, I don't want to be trying to, like, meet everyone with the flu or something. So that's uh, like, oh, do I schedule this and potentially let everyone down? Do I just not do it? And then people are like, you were in the UK and you didn't do a thing. How dare you? So I'm, I'm torn and I don't know what to do yet. I'm going to think on it some more. Oh, my hat? This is a new hat, isn't it? Yes, it is a prototype. We're making some changes still. Only a little bit of change. But we think they will go into production. They'll be 
uh, $29.99, and we like it, or at least I like it. We're in the prototype. All right, Preston John says, speaking of osmosis, have you ever used C-Lab Formula 28 work long-term for a snail tank or any freshwater tank for that matter? Yes, one of my favorite products from back in the day. That being said, so I love C-Lab Formula 28. I like the little blocks though. Or the blocks are this big, not the big 2.2 or 1 kg blocks. Um, but they're, for people that don't know what they are, they're basically a ton of trace elements in a bunch of calcium. Kind of like a more advanced version of Wonder Shells that are crazy hard to find. I feel like they're like a backyard company that just like, kind of makes them sometimes. And so when I, they, I think they've restructured or gone out of business or, or something like that a couple of times. What I ended up doing is I ended up dosing uh, marine salt because it gave me all the same benefits and was accessible and cheaper. But I still one day kind of want to make my own block type product that has a bunch of minerals in it. But I haven't gotten down that far, that trail yet, I guess. So that's what I, I would do is I like, if, you, if you've got a great supply, keep doing it. But if you're, you know, there can be hard to find, at least when I was tracking them down. I, I try and track them down every three years or so. And I'm like, dang, they're still hard. But yes, uh, I like that product. Do you have any experience with mud bottom tanks, like no sand or anything? No. That sounds like a terrible idea. With no cap, it's just a like a gunky mess always. Well, I shouldn't say always, but from initially that sounds non-appealing to me. With no cap. Oh yes, there is a discount code. Uh, Linda Press said I ordered from you today thanks for the discount code. I always forget. Uh, there's a discount code Sponge Filters 12. That's right, Sponge Filters 12. It gets you 12% off all sponge filters, intake sponges or pre-filters, and sponge pads. I think it goes till Sunday. You'd have to look at the website to fully confirm that. Um, people have been asking, like, what's your Black Friday schedule? Uh, we're pretty much doing that right now. It's a sale every week. Um, there'll be a sale on Thanksgiving. I don't 100% know what it is. That being said, I'm very aware that any sale I do would be less than the sale I do now. So what does that mean? That means on Thanksgiving, sponge filters will not be more than 12% off because that will just teach people that, oh, I should wait. So if anything, sponge filters will be at a less discount if they're on discount at all. So if you're hesitating, don't, and buy stuff now. Like if you want sponge filters, I promise you, they will not be cheaper at all compared to right now. You know, there's a chance it could be the same price, which, spoiler alert, they're not. But, you know, they won't be cheaper. I can tell you that right now. All right, let's, let's dive in here. Are green tiger barbs man-made? Yeah, they're uh, in a, a pro... Well, there's the glowfish version, definitely man-made. But then green tiger barbs are selectively bred to get more and more of that green coloration. I love that fish, by the way. I filmed eight videos today so I could make sure that if I came back from China sick that we wouldn't have an interruption in video releases. But yes, I talked about green tiger barbs in one of, in one of my videos. Oh, oh I, hit, I said the so. That might be the first so of the night. Hey, Where do I get my Arandas? I bought some that don't even look like Arandas. I got these ones... From King, I got some from King Koi and Goldfish. I don't know. In my opinion, they're the ones I have some problems with. You know, and and I wanna, I don't want you guys to necessarily be afraid of them. I'm very picky when it comes to spending two to three hundred dollars per fish. And like, you know, like this one. Let's see, right here, has got a weird kind of growth somewhere on its wind. Then there's some other ones that have wens that are misshapen, you know, like for instance, corpsey there behind there was not a cheap goldfish and yet very inactive compared to other goldfish I bought at the same time. Hmm. Right. So it's just, 
I think there's some real good diamonds there, and I think there's some, uh, I don't know about diamonds in the rough, but for that kind of money, they should all be diamonds. And most of the other fish, like, let's say, all of those guys, and like that calico we imported from other countries, and were much cheaper. And I'm honestly thinking about just shopping Pet Smarts, Pet Co's, and I found tons of good goldfish there. Now, not like I'm going to win a goldfish show, but wow, that fish is crazy good composition for $11. Like that type. So if I just go and shop all those, you can find, because they're going to bring in, they might have 50 of them, and one of them is going to be like, wow, that thing is the winner right there. I want that one. And you can hit a lot of Petco's and PetSmarts and find some pretty good fish, quarantine them all, get them super healthy, and save yourself a ton of money to find good quality fish like that. And it's fun to grow them out. Ooh. Can I do that move? Tiffany's, Tiffany White's got the chair thing. Can I do that? My chair doesn't really do that that well. But thank you. Do I know anything about melanistic fish or how to begin breeding for melanism in wild-caught fish? I don't know enough about the Punnett square to know recessive versus dominant genes and that kind of stuff. So I don't know enough. I'm, I'm a bad source of information for you. I'm not sure that a lot of people know. Otherwise, I think we'd be making a lot more albino fish. Are glow is going to be a thing? I think so. And the reason I, I think so is because... I met a person that was working on some glowfish and they also bred a ton of bettas. And so in my mind, I'm like, that seems pretty likely, but I don't know. I would say that's one of the few um, fish that I'm like, we really don't need glow versions of a betta. They already come in like 4 billion colors, but... I remain op or optimistic. Maybe they're going to do something where I'm like, wow, never knew I needed glow bettas so much in my life. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Aaron Price asks, if I do an interview with Ocean Aquarium about no water changes, more than deep sand bed, he also believes in keeping all fish except Africans at 6'8" and add microlift special uh, weekly, you don't need a water change. I mean, if you're asking if I've spent several, several hours with Justin at Ocean Aquarium, the answer is yes. Uh, so is Dean, right? Like, I'm not gonna go and interview him because I don't agree with everything that he says. So for instance, it's one thing to say, you don't do any water changes, right? So I could say, well, I never change water in that aquarium. I don't change water, but water automatically changes. Same thing at a store. Never doing a water change, but every time you sell a fish, if you get a bag of water and then you have to top off with fresh water, you're changing water. So it's like semantics there of like, well, and I realize not all fish are selling and that yes, it is a much reduced rate compared to most fish stores. I'll give it that as well. Um... But the problem when you interview someone is you, you get their side of the story. And so like Dean was asking him quite a few questions. And the reason he runs deep sand beds, because his father did. And his father always had success. Now, do they need to be seven inches deep like Justin runs them? Or could they be four inches deep? You know, so it's like, well, and maybe he's run enough tests. Maybe he hasn't. Um, but I personally have run tests with uh, micro lift. Never seen it do anything at all. Like I, in my opinion, snake oil, right? And so is it that that is the key? Maybe it is in his system. Running all fish at 6.8, most fish can do it. It's just not optimal. You know, like for sure I've read almost every African I've ever kept at, at seven, but not necessarily optimal. Um... Yeah, so I don't think I would do a interview with him because what, what am I trying to say here? A couple of things. I think I would want to 
have a discussion. So not an interview, but like, let's talk about this topic for a long time. And then when I interview someone, I feel like it's my job to poke the holes. Like, what about this? Did you run this test? Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you try that? Did you try this? Because I don't want, you know, like, oh, this store doesn't run water changes. Therefore, no one should ever have to change water. Like, that's not a true statement either. And we need to do comprehensive, critical thinking to go, well, what could be going on? Oh, we're selling fish. That's changing water. Got a lot of live plants taking nutrients out. We trim the plants. That also is nutrient export. What about feeding? What are we feeding in there? What fertilizer is he using? And he is using fertilizers, by the way. And he's running CO2 in some tanks. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on that if you were just to watch, like, the video we've done on it, you don't, not everyone walks away from that video and critically thinks about, how oh, was that being done? And so I wouldn't want to, it's, I don't want to say it's misinformation, but I don't want to lead people down a path without them understanding how to do it. Oh, Devlin asked about glow bettas. Uh, I haven't really seen anything about it. Well, other than like people asking about it and like meme culture about it, but I haven't been like, ooh, in the back alleys, look at that glow betta. I got the inside track. Nothing like that. All right. While in China, can you please see if you can find the company that makes those really cool porcelain fish ponds? Yes. I mean, that's easy. There's probably 50 of them there. The problem is, can you pay the insane amount of money to import them? Like, they're a ceramic, high breakability, can't ship them around the country. Like, you could be like, cool, I brought in 400 of them to Ohio. I sold 26 of them in Ohio. I'm negative $42,000 at this point. Like, that's why they're not in America, because America's so big, and moving them around America is so costly. Then you also have the thing of, like, all the lighting and any of the pumps being used are not built for our type of power. So it would be quite a bit, but... Yes, anyone could go to China and be like, cool, here's 50 manufacturers, but the reason they're not here is because of the reason I just stated. Get around that? Sure. Maybe import them into a super metro area and then convince all of Seattle they need a deck pond or a pond inside their house. And then if you could do that, you'd be better off just selling them something else and actually making more money that's not highly breakable. And needs a truck to be delivered and got to get up flights of stairs and like all these like logistical challenges, you know, cause people forget like, Oh, that big bowl is so cool. And it's this tall. It doesn't fit through a normal door. Like, Oh, like if you've ever been in that situation where you've bought an aquarium that doesn't fit through a house door or it doesn't fit through the door of the room it needs to go in. You're like, well, the exterior door was 36 inches, but the interior doors are only 30. Uh Oh, like, there's a lot of stuff that goes into product being brought in. And that's, so, I don't think they're ever going to be sold in mass here. You see them every once in a while in some of the Chinatown districts where they'll bring it a couple of them in, in addition to a bunch of other stuff. But they start at usually twelve to $1,400. So, it's a very high price tag when you're going, wait a second, I'm getting a giant aquarium for that kind of money. Yep. All right. New member, Michael Keith. Thank you. Will's tank started with iridescent sharks eight years ago. I've been through an iridescent shark phase where we had Andre the Giant was two feet, blind in both eyes. We had, we got him at the store I worked at, and he was brought in with the tank, and he had lived his whole life in a 75-gallon tank because that was the biggest tank the family could ever afford. And he had rubbed his pectoral fins down to the bone. So the first ray of the fin was just bone. And then the fin started from back there because it, to go back and forth in the aquarium, rubbed down and there was no more flesh or skin. So I ended up, I had a tank that's the same size that Murphy's in right now. It was actually slightly bigger. And it was in there, but even that was like not big enough. So we eventually, after keeping it for like a year, I couldn't find a way to really, they're very skittish fish. I felt like even this tank's not big enough. We found a indoor tropical pond with a guy that kept a bunch of stingrays that ended up taking him. So Andre the Giant 
we had other Pangasius or iridescent sharks with him as well. So we had a school. We tried a lot of things to get him to calm down. Uh, but he would eat like an eight ounce bag of Hikari wafers in a sitting. You know, most people don't know that iridescent sharks lose all their teeth as they grow. Am I running tests on underground filters still? Nope. There is no current tests on those. <coughs> mm. Recon says, I'd love to love a review on the aquarium co-op sponge filter. Why should I buy a coarse sponge over a finer sponge? Wouldn't the finer sponge catch more debris? Uh, yeah, it would. I mean, that's not really a review you're asking for. You're asking for an opinion on why you, you would use it. And if you use a very fine one and it chokes out, it stops working. So kind of like bio rings. Bio rings have surface area that are insanely high. The pores are also so fine that they get clogged up from bacteria, in which case it's actually very poor surface area. Same thing with a sponge filter. It's super fine. It collects all the fines out of the water. It clogs up and all the bacteria in the center of it dies out. Thus, not working anymore. Whereas a coarse one, that can never happen, but it also can never polish out the super fines. But we want to use it for larger mechanical debris, and we want to use it um, for biological. Now with a fine sponge filter, you should probably be servicing it one to two times a week to keep it biologically active, depending on load. Like if you have two zebra danios and a sponge filter this big, like that ratio is not correct um, in terms of one to two times a week. But in an aquarium that might be a 55, you've got two sponge filters, you should be servicing them once a week to keep them viable and not relying on, let's say, gravel and plants and that kind of stuff. That being said, most all of us have way more filtration than we will ever need, so that's why we don't see the problems with uh, most sponge filters, fine or not. Where if you're raising tons and tons of fish, that kind of stuff, you can actually run into that problem a lot more frequently because bio loads or ammonia loads are so much higher that you can actually see some of those crop up. And, uh, you know, I think, I believe it's best for other people to review a product. And so actually review. So like if you were to ask Dean or ask some other breeder or, or a fish room person why they like it, because inherently I'm biased on, well, I designed a product that I like. Of course I like it. Where you can have someone else and they can go, I like all this, but I hate this part. I'm like, oh, fair enough, you know. Would I mix long fin and short fin danios? Yeah, probably. Um, I don't really see a problem with that. Is a Fluval planted 3.0 worth the cost if Bluetooth is not important? Is there any better light for the same price and no frills? I don't know of any other light that has the same warranty and build quality. That's not true. I mean, I guess if you could find a 2.0 at a substantial discount that was brand new. Assuming it would still uphold the warranty, do that. But the fact that it's so waterproof and the warranty is so awesome, that's the hardest part to be. Whether you ever touch it with Bluetooth or not. You know, that's... See, I, I feel like maybe that's part of why companies don't upgrade. is because you're now searching for a light that does everything it does, and then they gave Bluetooth for free, essentially. Like, the price didn't go up because of Bluetooth. They just included it. And now someone's like, oh, I don't want that. So clearly there must be a cheaper version. And I'm not specifically calling you out, but overall, if you pulled millions of customers, like that's, that's a line of logic people have. And so by it doing more things, they're like, there's got to be a cheaper version of this same thing. And that's not always true. You know, a lot of times we'll make things better and it'll cost the same price. So... But I don't, I can't think of a light that is as good that would be cheaper or even, not even cheaper. I'm not sure I can think of a light that is as good at all. And what I mean by that is like a Kessel light, it's pretty good. It's more expensive, but it's not waterproof. Like Phoenix lights have terrible warranties. I'm trying to think of who else did I... I actually value like maybe 
like an Aquanet light, the right one, maybe, but the fact you can't adjust it. The closest thing, honestly, is a light that I have in my fish room right now that I'm playing with is a light, it's a, a shop light from Costco. It's the closest thing. The color temperature is terrible, it looks bad, but it's adjustable and it was really cheap and it's IP65 rated, which, you know, I believe the full light is IP67, which that two points makes a big difference, by the way, if you don't know IP ratings. Um, but, you know, it's not bad. And I bought one just to play with it, just to make sure it like, wasn't better. And then I would have to change my tune and be like, you know what, just go buy this Costco light. Dean and I both looked at it and we're like, well, yeah, it's not horrible. It's not horrible, though. If you don't mind your tank looking orange and yeah, like a yellowy orange, it's pretty good. But I think most people, we care how it looks. And so it, it looks off. You have to have a canopy. It bleeds light everywhere. There's, there's some stuff that's not choice about it, but pretty decent. We need to sweepstakes to meet you. That would be illegal. I can't do that. That's gambling. Uh, well, actually, that's not true. A true sweepstakes, if there was no money involved at all, and we provided a non-online way to enter, it could technically be done, but it sounds like an incredible amount of work to pull that off. Aaron Eustace? Gotta be Eustace. New member, welcome. Can you breed Cory's with guppies? Typically, Cory's will eat guppy fry, from my experience. Whenever I've tried it several times, and we always get not very much um, fry. Let's talk about fish. Oh, Diane, I'm sorry. The next hour is dedicated to not fish now. Let's see what you've done. On my 20 tall, I would like to polish the water a bit more. I have an extra large sponge filter, heavily planted, and five rabbit snails. I mean, more filtration, finer filters. That's more water changes, more gravel vacuuming, switching foods. Like, what's the source of your water not being clear? You could use something like, like this clarifier that I have sitting way back here. This is a flocculent. And basically it bonds with stuff that's floating in your water, making it coarser so it can get filtered out. But I think finding, you know, like if you have a bacterial bloom, none of what I just said would work at all. Or if you have a green water bloom, none of that would work either. Um, so finding the source, is it food? Is it one of those bacterial or algae blooms? Is it physical debris? Is someone digging all the time? Like in here, it's actually lighting. The, the haziness is this camera with that lighting causing it because in person it's not as bad um but right now like goldfish digging constantly uh, do make some debris in the water welcome dan welcome to the team if you breed a platinum guppy and a black mosaic guppy would they create black platinum mosaic guppies or cancel each other out neither Usually you'd have to line breed them to get anything like that out of there. And you got to use a Punnett square to see what would be dominant and recessive. You'll probably just get a kaleidoscope of all colors out of that initial breeding. Then you got to take some of those, breed them back together. Then you would start getting some of the desired results you're looking for. What do I recommend for a Chinese algae eater? Uh, like, are you asking size wise? I would say at least 55 gallons. I get pretty large. They're fairly territorial. And keep them with other fish that can evade that, I guess. Um, what's the relative PPI of quilt batting or polyfill versus like a 45 PPI foam uh, from porret polyfill? Is polyfill denser? Yes. So... I believe that polyfill is more like a five micron, but I don't know. Well, Google might tell us. Let's see if micron can translate to PPI, pores per square inch is what that stands for. Five micron to PPI. Let's see if it can do that. Mm, no. All right, let's try. Let me spot out pores per square inch. Somewhere that... Oh, we're here. might be right here. My mesh micron conversion chart reference in a PDF. Okay. Nope, that just 
Wait. Fours per square inch? Nope, that ain't gonna do it either. Dang it. I can tell you this that uh at one third of a micron, that'll filter out smoke, paint pigments. At 0.4 of a micron, will filter out all bacteria. At 1.0, filters out mold. At 5, I know that gets ick, and it will also get green water. Is there anything else kind of... Yeah, sand is filtered out at 75. I guess all these are a range, by the way. So 75 to 1,000. But no, it doesn't... I don't know how to... I don't know how to convert that, but yes, polyfilter is going to be a lot more dense and is going to be a smaller micron size, or it would be a higher PPI size because that means there's more pores per square inch, you know. But it like pour it or not pour it foam, but uh, polyfilter might be like a thousand PPI. I well, let me check and make sure that we we can't do that. Yeah, nothing with any type of that is coming with PPI. So unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know how you figure that out. Would you need like a spectrometer to do that? I don't even know how you would, I don't know how you'd even start to figure that out. Can tinfoil barbs go in a planet tank? They're likely to go to Munchtown on that. It's not a good idea. Same with silver dollars. You might be able to get away with like Anubius and Java Ferns, but a lot of the other stuff might not work out so hot. Have I ever gotten Rainbow Shiners? Yes. Um, there's got to there's got to be in videos. I know I've I've done them probably two or three summers ago, three summers ago, four summers ago, might be like five summers ago now. But yes, definitely played with them before. What's the best way to add fluorite sand without introducing a ton of dust? And is there anything better to polish than filter floss? Uh, the new fluorite bag should have the bag that opens up from the bottom. Hold on. Oh, sand though. Ooh, it might not have the filter or the mesh bottom. So a sand, it's like washing any other sand, dump it into a bucket and rinse, 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 rinse. Keep stirring and rinsing, stirring and rinsing, stirring and rinsing. And that's about as good as you can get. The other way you can do it is get like a mug of that sand and then lower it into the water all the way to the bottom. Wow, that got really blurry. Focus on my hand. And then dump it in slowly. If you dump it from the top, all the fine particulates come out of it. You could also drain your water all the way down to the floor, put all your substrate in, then fill it back up slowly, and that would help you as well. And in terms of polishing better than filter floss, I mean, there are micron filters, but for practicality, there's not a lot more than micron filters and water changes, really, is the answer. Look up what porosity is. Okay. You need more caps, bro. All right, here we go. Porosity, the state of quality of being porous. I knew that. Yep. Let's look at Wikipedia. The void or empty spaces in material. You knew that. Yep. Uh, could be as a percentage between zero and a hundred percent. We knew that. Void fraction and two phase flow. That I don't know. Frosty in earth sciences and construction might do it. So it comes down to an equation that I couldn't answer. Because to fill in the variables is a paragraph this long. So, yeah. Normal particle density is assumed to be approximately 2.65 grams of silica sand although a better estimation could be obtained by examining the lithology of the particles. There, I mean, it looks like they're using quite the microscope to analyze this, so I, I do think that possibly, yeah. Uh, 
I think we are off track though, because someone says there's a conversion table on filterbag.com. The reality is I just don't care that much. Like we spent enough time looking at it. We can all Google that. And I don't think I need to know what the PPI is live while on the stream. I could look up later, but the reality is I'll probably never care only because I know it's finer, but it won't help me in relation. Like if you knew Polyfilter is uh, a PPI of 327, that is like in no relation to 45 PPI, right? Because you'd just be like, oh yeah, it's 45 PPI, it must be really coarse. Like, no, it's still crazy fine. And so you'd be like, oh, 10 PPI is really coarse. So it's just, it gets into those things of like, these are statistics my brain doesn't need to know because it's never going to be practical. Whereas like learning the difference between 30 PPI, 35, 40, 45, 50, all the way to maybe 10, that range, very important. So I probably wouldn't follow up on it. What's my favorite color of guppy? Mm, I really like yellow ones, but I don't have any at the moment. Is going to be a Thanksgiving live stream? Yes. I don't know what time it's going to start yet. I don't know how long it's going to go for. That is going to be a game time decision on is Corey sick or jet lagged from China? Because I only get back the day before. If everything's on, maybe it goes eight hours. If it's like, whoa, I'm, I can't do any, then maybe I can't do any. I don't know. We'll plan when we get closer. Pop bottle, CO2. Will it gas off at night and drop pH? Yes. So if you're talking inverting a pop bottle and CO2 being in there and water running by the outlet, it would introduce more CO2 into the water, assuming it wasn't already at super saturation, and it would lower the pH. That being said, I'm not necessarily convinced that that pH is problematic. And what I mean by that is there's so many tanks that run crazy low pH in planet tanks that should just kill the fish, but they don't. I feel like there's a different, uh, something going on, like in general, crazy low or crazy high injected CO2 tanks. I'm not sure it's the pH causing a problem. It could be something else. But I'm not sure because you can, you know, you can just put too much CO2 in and keep the pH high and still have problems with fish. But yes, it would, oh, hold on, will it gas off at night pH drop. Well, yes, the pop bottle itself will introduce CO2. Yes, it'll still gas off at night just like it would during the day. pH would drop, but pH is, so here's part of the problem is pH is dropping, it, well, it's moving all the time in an aquarium. So let's say you only put CO2 into your aquarium during the day. And let's say your aquarium is running at 7.1 pH. You then turn the CO2 off and it rises in the next two hours to 7.6. Lights shut off. Now, plants are consuming oxygen and releasing CO2. And maybe by the morning, it's now at 6.8, right? So you see how it's like, well, the pH is doing this. And yet, that happens all the time and our fish don't react to it. And it's, I think, outside of those things or running into a point where there's not enough oxygen. Like, that's what I learned with a oxygen meter or dissolved oxygen meter was that running out of oxygen from having so many plants is actually a much bigger problem than injecting CO2 in, my, in the way I keep fish in the hobby. So even though I inject CO2, the problem would be running out of oxygen by morning, not having too much CO2 during the day. Because during the day, plants are making tons of oxygen, it's fine, they're using it up. At night, even with ox or CO2 off, it was plants consuming so much of the oxygen that it was dangerous levels in the morning. So I think there's a lot that we still need to learn and understand. And I'm sure there's people like Tom Barr that like totally know and get it. But the average hobbyists are still making these um, connections in their own, you know, pathways in their brain of like, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. One question to the chat is, do we use Kelvin in Australia? Because all that comes up when looking at lights is watts when looking for a light. Well, watts... You know, we, so this might be a, a perfect time to plug the blog. We have a blog on the website, and this week's article was about lighting. 
it specifically talks about Kelvin ratings. And uh, I don't know if, we, I can't remember if we specifically addressed in the latest version, if it talked about watts, definitely that LEDs were less wattage, but watts are a measurement of how much power something uses. Kelvin rating is the rating of the color. Let me, I'm gonna butcher this, but to save time, I'm not gonna look up the exact words, but basically I believe Kelvin rating is the measurement of the color when looked at versus something like charcoal that has been burnt so that you can measure it against it. Lots of fancy verbiage to say, I can, I can, I can show you on the screen right now. This is gonna be perfect. Let me, let me do this. All right, so this is the lighting, lighting my face right now. 5,600 Kelvin. The 25% is the wattage. So of this LED light, we're only using one fourth of its strength. If we crank up the strength, here, how do I do that? There we go. We're gonna crank it up to like 50%. You're gonna see me get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, right? We're at 50% now. We go to 100, can I just hold? No, I can't hold it, I gotta go all the way. You see how I'm starting to get like blown out in color? Right? Oh, it's going down now? Come on. What are you doing? We're gonna go to 100 on this thing, and then I'm gonna play with Kelvin for you. So once I, oh geez. It's actually hard to look at the camera now. All right, so we're at 100. This is as bright as this light goes. So that would be like wattage, right? So as, and this LED light probably doesn't work this way, but as we used more wattage, it got brighter. Right, but think of watts as like brightness for a lot of stuff. It was much more important when you use T8 bulbs, T5 bulbs, power compacts. With LEDs now, now a one watt LED could be crazy powerful versus not powerful. So it doesn't necessarily work anymore, but then we can change the color temperature. The 5600 Kelvin is this white-ish color. Let's see, how do I, I wanna go, there we go. So now, I'm changing the Kelvin rating. You see how my face is getting more and more red? The lower it is, the more red it'll be. So now we're at 4,000 Kelvin. This is the color that that Costco light is, 4,000 Kelvin. You see how I'm much more red and my hands are orange? Your whole aquarium would look like this. Then we'll go to a normal, what they call a soft white bulb that you would read by. If you put it in a lamp, this would be a reading light. This is 2,800 Kelvin is what we want. Oh, won't go that low. We can only go to 3,300. But you can see now I'm like really red. So that's the Kelvin rating is that color temperature. Now there's a whole nother one that gets weird and that's the CRI, which would be the color rendering index. And does it peak in blues and, and greens and white? Well, I don't know if it peaks in white, but um, let me go to, yeah, we're back. We're back at 5,600 Kelvin. Now let me try to, all right, we're gonna dial this back down to like 25%, and I'm gonna keep answering questions, but your question originally was, all you see is wattage. Wattage was the king of lighting for a very long time in our hobby, probably 20 or 30 years. That no longer really applies, so what we wanna use is par or per, and I wasn't able to show that on the screen, but as it got brighter on my face, if we were to hold a par meter here, we could have shown that it got more intense. And maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll go find my par meter out in the garage and next time I'll show you that real time. Uh, but that is how we wanna judge intensity of a light. Kelvin rating is that temperature like we just saw. Is it more white? Is it more orange? If we went to, if this number went to uh, 12,000, it'd be very blue, right? We see that a lot in saltwater aquariums, or 20,000 is very, very blue. That's when we see a blue ocean, that's 20,000. So Kelvin would be the color of light, the wattage would be how much energy it's using, but how intense that light actually is would be par or per that we'd wanna use, and that takes a meter. But in general, a lot of times you dig enough on the internet, you can see, oh, this light at this level on an aquarium would be this much par at the substrate. And that's kind of how you need to navigate it, unfortunately. But if you were to go on to our blog, make an account, you get those emailed automatically to you every week, but you could read more in depth. Well, not, I wouldn't say more in depth than that, but 
you could read about it more. Cause we didn't go, we didn't want to go crazy in depth there, but the article is how to choose the right aquarium light. So it teaches you a lot about a lot of those things. Um, am I planning on having Haplocaris? Oh, I can't say that word. Sciaticus? Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see. This is why common names exist, by the way, because when you can't pronounce. Oh, the true parrot cichlid. Uh, what is the question? Am I going to have any? Probably not. I think they're a cool fish. I've had them in the past, but I'm not out to necessarily keep them right now. But who has some? I think maybe AJ. Um, I don't know what his YouTube channel is. AJ Aquatics, maybe? I think he's working on breeding some. Why are wild type mollies so hard to find? Uh, mostly because there's not a market for them. So in general, when things are hard to find, there's no market. If they, if if people were spending, like, for instance, if people were spending twenty dollars per wild molly in stores all day long, all the stores would have wild mollies. That being said, you could probably hop on to. Well, it's middle of winter, but let's see if there's any on Aquabid right now, because people would just pull them up with a net all the time from Florida because they're so abundant. Oh, Aquabit is slow today. Real slow. Kessel versus Fluval, which is better in my opinion. If money is no object and you can spend, like in this aquarium, I'd probably have to spend three to $4,000 to light it properly. I might enjoy the Kessel look better. That being said, this has $800 worth of lights and I like it a lot. So... That's that difference there of like, uh, and I can't even say because I've never had that much Kessel lighting that I could actually say it's better, but it is highly tunable and I do like shimmer effect quite a bit until I get tired of it. So if you take money away, I can go either way. If you factor money in, flu ball every time at the moment. I hope that Kessel becomes more price aware and might work out better for them. What was I looking up on Aquabid? Oh yeah, mollies. Under US native fish. There is flagfish, there's killies. There are no wild mollies at the moment, but if you get yourself in spring or summertime, usually you can pick them up for like 30 bucks shipped to your door. All right. Some people are nuts shipping fish to uh, Minnesota when it's 10 degrees. Well, from a guy that ships fish, or has shipped fish, it's easier to ship fish when it's freezing than it is when it's too hot. Too hot is way harder, because you know, you can't, it's, keeping fish cool is really hard. Eating them up, not as hard. Now, the problem becomes when people aren't home to receive them and all that kind of stuff, like that makes it much more difficult, but shipping fish when it's 10 degrees outside to our store, almost never a problem because there's always someone to receive them. They're, you know, sent with a deadline, that kind of stuff. So it, you know, part of the problem is right now, the consumer market's not willing to pay shipping a lot of times. That's the biggest problem is, well, I need you to ship them in the middle of winter for $10 and I need them to be overnighted and I need them to be held by these people. And it's like, well, no, that just, that's just not going to work. So that's why a lot of people suspend shipping because... People aren't willing to pay it. So they wait till it warms up. All right. Uh, Nylock G makes a product called Thrive C. They claim it has non glute based carbon source that will help plants grow like CO2. Does that even make sense? You're always saying that you can't replace CO2. Well, so if I read that statement, I can prove lots of things. So for instance, uh, well, here we go. This right here, this extreme flake food. This is a non-glute based carbon source for your aquarium. Anything that's in there, it's pretty much got carbon in it. So technically this is true, right? There's no, well, I guess I'm not a thousand percent sure there's no liquid glutaraldehyde in here, but I'm pretty confident there's not. So even that is true. Technically, this lid, if I was to put this lid in the aquarium, this would be a non-glute source of 
carbon, technically. All right? Now, this goes way down into chemistry that I don't know, carbon chains and things like that. All right? So just know that you're going to get my opinion as a hobbyist, store owner, product developer, as much as I know, and not I'm a crazy chemist. All right? But in general, liquid CO2 does not do the same thing as gas CO2. Gas CO2 works much different. So much so that you can even use liquid carbon sources with gas CO2 in the same aquarium. Right? Also, you might be able to do your own little brain, not little, I don't want to say you have a little brain. I'm trying to say a little bit of thinking and you go, wait a second, that's true. Why is it that fluteraldehyde can kill algae, but CO2 injected does not kill algae? Because they're not the same way, right? So if I read the statement again, does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I don't believe it's a replacement for CO2. I don't know what their non-glute based carbon source is. I would guess it is beneficial for plants. With all the carbon sources on the world, which is pretty much like everything, you would choose something that is beneficial for plants. Um, but yeah, that's, that's as much as I know about it. Uh, why would you say Anubis dies off, but all my other plants live just fine? Dosing Easy Green at one pump per 10 gallons. Uh, it's very easy to get into a spot where it's being outcompeted. So, for instance, if I have a stem plant that can grow a foot a week, and I put one pump of Easy Green into my 10 gallon, and I've got an Anubius that can grow one leaf a month, this plant's going to eat all the nutrients, and this thing's going to struggle, struggle, struggle. Now, without knowing more, I can't know if, um, like, is it turning yellow? Is it showing deficiencies first? Is it just dead in one day? Is it, you know, like, if you can watch it go downhill, then that story I just made up, probably true. If it just, like, was great, and then just one day, it's boom, gone. Like, all the leaves rot off or something like that. Like, maybe you put it in the gravel, and then all the leaves just rot off. That could be a thing, too. But usually, with that explanation or that question of like oh my plants are doing great but anubius isn't it's real easy for it to get out competed same with java fern any of the really slow growing plants can be out competed by faster growing plants but you might say like well i've only got root feeding plants and then oh that doesn't make sense anymore by the way aj fish what i was trying to think of his turbo fish his channel i think he's playing with some actual um parrot cichlids all right Ooh, am I planning a meme segment for any of the upcoming, ho upcoming holiday streams? I hadn't planned it, but I forgot about that. It might be. We'll see how much time I get. Yes, Maurice brings up a very good point. Well, I guess the carbon needs to be from in a form that plants can actually uptake. Yes, that is very important. And so part of the reasons why fish are so good is because when they poop stuff out, it becomes in a form at which it can be taken up by plants, right? And so... That's the thing. When we read marketing, like this box right here, this is an organic carb. Well, probably not organic anymore, but this is a carbon source for plants, technically, right? But we need to, like, we need to qualify it with, like, oh, that plants can uptake. And I don't know, knowing carbon chains, uh, what needs to bind with stuff to be able to make that specific type of carbon taken in. So. Turbofish confirms he is playing with parrots. There you go. Gas CO2 dissolves into the water and reacts with H2O in the form of carbonic acid. Carbon by itself doesn't become carbonic acid. Yes. True. All right. Water changes on multiple tanks or breeding tanks. Plumb them together somehow or just buy a python just buy a python like it's not worth risking uh illness and that kind of stuff yeah i, I i'm not a fan of plumbing tanks together pretty much ever there's that and yeah those 
you can get slightly easier by automating, but I'm not convinced it's still better. Like I still have to siphon, I still have to gravel vac, automating. Like automating is great for a guy like me that I'm essentially out of the country for three weeks. And without making my wife or other people do the water changes, I can automate that. But if I, like I actually believe my fish room and hobby was better when I had to physically do the water changes with a python. I was more in tune with my fish, but I also didn't have to travel. So I think if I take the travel away, and Dean's kind of got a system that's close to mine, it's not fully automated, but he's gonna go automate it because he's doing a little bit more traveling and that kind of stuff. And so I think it's a tool, but for most people, I do believe that a water change system like a, a gravel vac or a Python or any of that would be just, that's what you want. Cheap, affordable, wieldy, works well. Quarantine shrimp with the med trio? Uh, no, you don't need to. The only one that has an effect on shrimp of the parasites I know about would be the Ickex. Because it's got, um, no, that's a lie, not Ickex. Um, general cure, because it's got praziquentanol in it. And that treats whatever the one, I can't remember. It's not, Eliobiopsidae is the one that affects their swimmerettes. What's the one that looks like little spikes on their, um, like their forehead, their rostrum? I think, I think the forehead on a shrimp is the rostrum. What is that disease called? It's something I know, but my brain will not deliver it currently. Mm. Unsatisfactory. What are my thoughts on glowfish? We covered that a little bit earlier, Erica. So watch the replay and you'll get that whole segment. 12 gallon tank, do I get 50 watts or a 100 watt heater? Depends on, well, 100 watts. I just know the answer is 100 watts because 12 gallon tank typically, well, I'm assuming it's a Mr. Aqua 12 long. Does it have a lid? If it's got a lid, maybe you can get by with a 50, but in general, I just don't do less than 100 watts. So I recommend 100 watts. I watch you on television and love watching my goldfish. Yeah, I want a few more. See, like right now, that whole space is just empty. And I, I realize they're congregating right here. Like I don't want this level of busyness all the time, like every square inch. But I do want it so that when my, you know, my head's right here, that we can kind of see stuff going along here, a little bit more action. And so I'm just going to keep adding you know, three to five at a time until I go, ah, that's the one. Now we're, we've got the busyness I'm accustomed to. It's, it's hard. An 800 gallon takes just a lot of fish. Like, you know, this fish right here versus that fish right there. That might only look like 18 inches. That is literally three feet in between them because it's four feet front to back. So there's so much room uh, that it's hard not to look sparse. There was an auto feeder question. I is there an automatic, let me back up. Is there any automatic feeder that will be able to feed sinking pellets? I have one that feeds at night for my plecos and would be nice. Yeah, all, all automatic feeders should be able to feed pellet, sinking pellets. Like sinking pellets, now if you mean like a wafer, there's very few. There's like, what is that? There's like a, is it Petmate, I think makes it? Where it's like a big dial and it kind of spins and drops into the tank, but you can only load it up like seven or 14 days. Something like that maybe. What sellers of killifish that sell online do I recommend? I don't have any specific person, I don't think. I just would, I always just look on Aquabid and buy there. So a thousand red cherry shrimp and a 29 gallon is okay. I mean, definitely breeders and wholesalers do it, yeah. Whether you can keep them alive and thriving, I don't know that I could. That's, it might be beyond my capabilities. What are my thoughts on adding a hang on back filter for water polishing? I'm using two canister filters in my 125. I think that's a good idea, Paul. If you're looking to polish water, they're much easier to service. Just fill it with like quilt batting. And I use an aqua clear. I'm, I'm doing this move because that's how I remove aqua clear baskets. I kind of pinky and thumb and kind of grab it and pull it up and out. And you can kind of just wash it if you want to or throw it away and keep refilling. 
We do need a word of the day for KG Tropicals. I haven't thought of it yet, but we will. We will think of it. Advice on heating a pond? Look into, my first advice would be look into how to keep a pond from freezing for uh, cow and horse troughs. They use a lot of thermal heating. You build basically like a, a miniature greenhouse for it. That's where I would start because you get a lot of free heat from the sun even when it's cloudy. So I would start there. All right, what's the word of the day today? The word of the day today is going to be... Hmm. It is going to be... We should just... We should confuse them. We're going to do hashtag sponsored. So the word of the day is going to be hashtag sponsored. <laughs> He's going to wonder what that means. He's probably going to be like, is there a thing I'm missing? We'll see. I don't, I don't know if I'm being honest. I don't know how long I get to hang out in a stream tonight because the minute this ends, I got to look up. And if my wife has landed back in the state, I got to go to the airport for the third, only third time, third time this week. Yes. Had to go pick up plants a couple of times, and now I'm picking her up. Big D Smoke's going to Ocean Aquarium tomorrow. Maybe you'll run into Dean. Dean's down there. Wait, tomorrow? No, he's on a plane tomorrow. He won't be there. You won't run into him. All right. So, keyword is hashtag sponsored. We're going to KD Tropicals live stream. Hopefully, we're putting that in the chat. The goal is to get as many of us over there. Support them. If you like them, subscribe. If you don't, don't. No hard feelings. I hang out there while I do some other stuff. Usually, I'm waiting for dinner to finish and that kind of stuff. And then I just veg out and like, whoa. My brain pretty much melts down after this because I filmed eight videos before this. Then I go live. Then I remember like, okay, what is that disease that's on the rostrum of a shrimp? And then I go, dang it, it was. But when you're live, the light in your eyes and the harder I try to think about something, the more it won't come to, uh, won't come to my mind. New member, Michael St. John, well, thank you. Aaron Eustace, keeping me motivated in the hobby for a few years. Thanks for being rad. Well, thank you. I'm glad you stayed in the hobby for a few years. That is an accomplishment, by the way. I've been in and out of the hobby several times. You get down on your luck. This thing got sick. That's going wrong. Blah, blah, blah happens. You scale down. You scale back up. It's summer. I've been there. Quick winner question. Can I reseal tanks in 30 to 70 weather? 35 to 70 weather. I don't know what the minimum threshold is for the silicone curing. I, I think it's like 65, though. I would try and do it in, uh, in your garage and put a space here going. Speaking of Ontario, Canada, we have Easy Green in Canada. If you could do us a giant favor, if you have a Canadian... Amazon account, which I know all of us do, and you've used Easy Green, please go there and leave a review. It's only got four reviews right now, but the more reviews we get, the better it will do in the, the system in Canada. And for now, you can order it in Canada. Well, I say for now, like now you can. So if you don't have it yet and you want to try it out, you can order it up. That's a new thing. People ask us, are we going to do more products? Yes, we're working on the next product. We're going to do slow and steady release. There's a lot of qualifications to get a product across the border. There's a lot of stuff for Amazon. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this. Yes, it is our full intention to offer all the products that will make sense to everyone in Canada. Yes, when we are comfortable in Canada, will we start trying to launch in other countries? Yes. Do I know how long that'll take? No, I have no idea because it's a new set of hurdles. Each country you want to do business in, taking it slow and steady, for everyone else that's not in Canada right now or the United States, know that you've heard me say I was trying. We've been talking about it for years. And I won't say as always, but as is a common theme with the Aquarium Co-op, we try to actually accomplish what we say we're trying to do. If we stop trying to do something, we let you know going, hey, we gave up on that. We're never shipping fish again or whatever it is. And we circle back around if it ever makes sense again. We try to be open and honest. 
And right now, if we were picking another location, UK would be the next one. That being said, we have not started any of that process. So if you're sad, which you're probably already asleep right now, but if you're not, go to the KD Tropicals live stream, hashtag sponsored. I'll meet you there. I know he's got all new microphones and everything, so hopefully that echo thing is fixed. He spent a bun bunch of money, and uh, he cares about it, so let's go show him some love. I'm going to end this. Thanks for showing up, and I'll see you in a few weeks. Thanksgiving. All right. If I can find the buttons. Oh, no.